Uh, before I jump into the message this morning, though, I'm going to read a scripture and I'm going to put somebody on the spot. So everybody get tense and nervous because you don't know who it is. 1 Peter 3.15. He says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Mandy Hammonds, come here, please. <laughs> she had no clue this was coming. That's the second time this week. So I've heard a story this week or in the past week where Mandy had an opportunity to share her faith. And I'm just going to ask her to share it with us this morning. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate this. I don't know, I like talking in front of people. So, anyways, I'm not going to deny what the Lord told me to do. But So, about a week and a half ago, I was in Kingsport. That's where I'm from, Kingsport, Tennessee. And we were helping my sister um, move in. And I get out of the car, and my mom says, I hear someone preaching. And that's kind of irrelevant, but my mom's not the type to just say something like that. And so I thought that it caught me off guard a little bit, and I thought, oh. I need to go find out who this is that's preaching. So I get in my car, drive down the road, and I find it's, it's like a radio station sitting on the side of the road. They've got these big speakers that are blasting all across the like neighborhood or whatever. And they've got a row of preachers sitting listening to this Southern Baptist preacher preaching. And I that fires me up. Okay, so if someone's sharing the good news of Jesus, it doesn't matter in what form or what shape, that fires me up. I, I wanted to walk over and tell those pastors and to encourage them. That was the whole reason I went there, was just to stop and say, this fires me up. This is awesome. And this pastor looks at me and says, as soon as he gets done preaching, you're going to get up and preach. Mind you, I've never preached before. I don't feel qualified. And in fact, I had five minutes to figure this out. And I looked at him and I said, you lost your mind, like I'm not preaching. <laughs> and, and he's a little seven year old man, grabs him by the shirt and pulls me along. Well, let me just show you my equipment. Let me show you what I do, my ministry. So he's sidetracking my mind. I know what he's doing. And the whole time in my spirit, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit. Cause you know, when you feel that inside of you and you feel fear and you feel the Holy Spirit, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. There's a reason that that chest pumping inside of you that you're feeling that. There's a reason you're feeling that. Because if you think back to Adam and Eve, there was good and evil. So each time inside of us, we have good and evil fighting over us. So Satan is going to naturally put you in fear anytime that the Lord is calling you to do something. So I promised the Lord a couple of months ago that if he asked me to do anything and I felt that chest pumping that I would not deny that ever again. It has been an interesting ride, but I have watched him do amazing things. And so I did not deny him that opportunity. I said, okay, God, I got it. I get you. I had no clue what I was going to say. He literally, I'm on the radio, so this is what I did. Texted Ron and said, hey, pray for me. I'm about to preach. And he texted me, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, on the radio. And texted him like the thing or whatever. I want you to understand something. I wasn't doing that for people in that moment. Yes, there were people looking and they were watching, but there was only like six or seven like on a row. I was doing that for Jesus. I was being obedient to God and what he was asking me to do. So I get up and I start telling this 25 minute sermon that I don't even know where it came from. Just the Holy Spirit just downloaded it into my brain. And so the advice I would give for you guys right now because the enemy uses fear Step out in faith and start pushing that fear down. Because that's when the Lord's really going to release you to do some amazing things that you aren't capable of doing. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit's the one that does those things. You aren't good enough to do those things. We're all unworthy and we don't have it together. And I was extremely unequipped in that moment. But there's one thing that I do have, and that's the fire of Jesus. And I get fired up for the Lord. Oh, and so when I'm looking around at each one of you guys, when I see any lukewarm stuff going on, 
I, it breaks my heart. I was down on my knees laying down back there crying because it breaks my heart as to where we've, just like Sue said, come to where we're okay with abortion or we're okay with transgenders or whatever these political issues that have turned into political issue that is a God issue. And God is upset. He's up there breaking. His heart is breaking for us and for our country and for our young people. I don't blame our young people, to be honest with you. If they're looking around and they're looking to us and they see the lukewarm in us, it breaks my heart that this is the kind of things that they're seeing. No wonder they don't trust the church right now. I get it all the time. I work with college students. And they're so tired of the fake. That's the whole point. They're tired of the fakeness. They're over it. And they can look at each person in this room and they can read your mail within five minutes. They know everything about you and they know whether they can trust you or not trust you. And the thing that breaks my heart is that some of us won't humble ourselves before God down on our knees and cry out to Him because He's waiting on us. He's waiting on us to cry out to Him and ask Him to come and fill us up. So right now, what I would say to you guys is let's get fired up for Jesus. Who cares about who's sitting beside you? Do you think I care about stepping on your toes right now? I don't care. What pisses me off is that I say, hey, yeah, I'm human, and that's fine. And I have <laughs> what makes me mad. <laughs> I got a little tired of Jason. Lord, please forgive me. It's, it's not a cuss word in East Tennessee, I've heard. <laughs> What makes me mad, though, I'm being real and vulnerable with you guys right now, what breaks my heart is that we are caving to abortion, transgenders, all this sexual immorality. Everyone, it's become the norm to be addicted to pornography. Since when? Why is it okay to look at pornography? And so, I just want to say to you guys that we have got to stop siding and stop being in this gray area. The one thing that the Lord recently convicted me of was gossip. If you're talking about someone behind their back and it's not in a good way, period. It's gossip. There is no gray area. There is, you've got to stop living in the gray area because we're all living in the gray area where we say, oh, this is okay. And I don't want to step on that person's toes because I don't want to offend them and I don't want to upset them. Why? But you're okay with upsetting Jesus? You're okay with being okay with these things and hurting Jesus? Jesus sent his son to die on the cross for each and every one of our sins. All of our sins. Praise the Lord that we get an opportunity to be in a church like this and praise God because there are people in the country all around us that can't even say his name and they have a gun pointed to the back of their head because they're on their knees and they're saying, hey, let me ask you one more time, do you love Jesus? And they say yes and they're killed for it. But yet we can't talk about Jesus to our coworkers or our friends or our family because we're afraid of offending them and hurting them? Seriously? What are you guys so fearful of? I'm talking to myself. I just, I'm talking to all of us. What are we so afraid of? So that was a little Amen. bit. Amen. Right I'm really sorry. For saying. You should know that that does not offend me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I can just say, "All right, we're gonna go do baptisms now." I don't know how to follow that. I really don't. So back to baptism. We're excited this morning. It's our first baptism. Um, my goal is to preach a little shorter. We try to shorten everything by keeping the children in here, that sort of thing. But my goal is to teach a little shorter this morning. So I'm going to try to go. Every time I say that, I go like an hour. So we'll see how that goes. But the topic I'm going to talk about this morning should be one of the most talked about discussions in our church. It should be one of the most celebrated things that we do as a Christian in our faith. However, it's a topic that divides Christians. It's a topic that has caused denominations to divide, split, and create new denominations. It's a topic that two Christians can argue about for an hour defending their position 
Neither of them fully understanding the scripture behind it, while a non-Christian is watching them saying, that's what I don't want to be a part of. Today, as we discuss that topic, it's called baptism. We're going to try to answer some questions, but I'm going to try to go from the Bible. What does Jesus say? What did Paul say? What did Peter say? What did the men that were living in that time that showed us what baptism was, what did they say? Not what did your preacher tell you. Not what did your denomination tell you. And, you know, I think the theme this morning is we're not scared to step, step on toes. And i got to be honest with you. This morning I went back in my office and prayed before we started, and, and God showed me I had some fear. I had fear that I'm going to come in here and step on somebody's toes today. I repent of that fear right in front of me. I ask God to forgive me for that fear. Because I'm not going to step on your toes because I don't like your toes. I'm not going to step on your toes because I want to be that next preacher that brought you hellfire and brimstone. I want to step on your toes because maybe something lies in the balance that's bigger than my fear. And maybe it's your devotion. Maybe it's your obedience to Christ. I promise you, everything I say today is going to come from Scripture. In fact, this will probably be the most Scripture-heavy sermon I've done. That doesn't mean I'm going to get it all right. So if I say something today that offends you, that you disagree with, it's open for discussion. I promise you. Just bear with me. If I bring up one topic, don't jump ahead of me, please. Don't jump ahead to assume what I'm saying. Just bear with me as we go through it. I'm going to try to answer some questions. I need you to have an open mind. I'm going to try to answer what is baptism. Why should I be baptized? Who can baptize me? Is baptism a part of my salvation? Was the way I was baptized correct? Maybe some of you been baptized you're wondering if it was correct. Did I get baptized in the right place? So, how did I come up with these questions? These are questions I get asked every day. In two different churches before starting this, part of my job was to handle baptisms. And everything I'm talking about today comes out of the questions I was asked, the misinformation people have gotten. And every one of them would start the sentence with, this is how I was raised. This is what I was taught. And if I asked the question, did you ever go to Scripture to verify? No. Because I trusted the person who told me. So that's why I'm not going to ask you to trust me. I'm going to add, take you to Scripture and show it to you. So what does the word baptize mean? Baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself, to bathe. So, you know, sometimes in order to understand a word, we've got to look at what that word meant in the cultural perspective. So I'm thinking of an English word. I don't know why this word came to mind. Think of the word soak, S-O-A-K, soak. If I say I'm going to soak my clothes in water to get a stain out, what does that mean? Everybody scared to talk now? Yeah. <laughs> Andy, I'm going to get you for a testimony later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what does it mean to soak your clothes? Clean. Go ahead, Parker. You put it in water and it sits there for a while. Right. So if I tell you to soak this garment of clothing, you're going to put it in water, you're going to let it sit there in hopes that the water soaks in. Okay? So what if I said, today I hope you soak in what I'm saying. Does that same word have a different meaning? Somewhat similar. I'm hoping it'll soak in up here. Soak into your heart. Soak into your soul. Soak into your spirit. But I'm using the same word and it means a little bit different because we have, in our culture, we can use the same word to mean different things. Right? Right? Guess what? It was the same with the Greek culture and the Hebrew culture, etc. So if we're going to look at what the word baptizo means, I want to look a little deeper. Uh, let me go back to soak. So if I brought someone into this room that's just learning English for the first time, and I told them, I hope you will soak up what I'm telling you today. Do you think they're going to understand what I'm saying? It's going to confuse them. Because they're thinking soak means to put something in water or solution or something. And I'm telling them to soak it into here. They're going to be very confused, right? So that's why I want to make sure we understand what this word means. So back in their culture, for example, if a vessel, a sea vessel, a ship, or whatever sank, completely went underwater, they would say it was baptizo. It was fully submerged in water. 
but it has a little bit deeper cultural meaning. There's actually two words. I want to make sure I get these right. Bapto and baptizo to mean almost the same thing. So I went back and found what I think is a culturally relevant thing from the year 200 B.C. Okay, so this is before Christ comes. There is actually a documented recipe for how to make pickles. Do you think a recipe for pickles went back that far? So what's a pickle before it's a pickle? Cucumber, Cucumber right? Everybody with me? So this Greek physician and poet, living in 200 B.C., said... In order to make a, pe a pickle, you got to take the cucumber and you got to dip it. And he used the word bad toe. You got to dip it into boiling water and then baptizo it in a vinegar solution. What's the difference? Both of them, he took the vegetable, completely submerged it in something. One water, one vinegar. Doesn't matter about the water and vinegar. But the first one was temporary. The first one, the bad toe, was he put it in water and took it out. The second one produced a permanent change. And he used two different words. So baptizo, the intent of baptizo is to produce a permanent change. To signify a permanent change that's been made within you. See when that cucumber was dipped in boiling water, what happened? I guess it got clean. I'm not a cook. I don't know. But what happened when it got submerged in the boiling water taken out? Nothing changed, right? It just got clean. But when it was submerged, baptizo, in vinegar, what happened? It totally changed. It totally changed from a pickle, I'm sorry, from a cucumber to a pickle. So again, I'm giving you that illustration from more of a cultural standpoint to say so many times we look at baptism as an act. You know what I heard growing up? Baptism is an act. It's an outward expression of an inward change. I don't disagree with that, but that's not all it is. It's not just an act. It is supposed to represent something that is permanently changed within us. Kind of like accepting Jesus Christ. When I accept Jesus Christ into my life, when I believe in Jesus, when I profess it with my mouth, what should happen? There should be a change. There should be a change in how I treat people. There should be a change in how I act. There should be a change in how I react. So I want you to get that in your head. The word baptizo doesn't just mean an act. It doesn't just mean to submerge. It means looking for something that represents permanent change. So why should we get baptized? i got five points I want to make, and I'm going to go through them pretty quick. Why should we get baptized? You know, i got a reason... My first reason is, Jesus got baptized. Jeff said earlier, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. Luke 3, 21 and 22, and it's, it's listed throughout the gospel, but I picked this one. It says, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. So my first reason for why would you get baptized, Jesus did it. I don't mean this to sound as facetious as it's probably going to sound, but last time I checked, if Jesus did it and you follow that, you're in pretty good footsteps. But something special happened in that moment. He didn't just go down into the water like everyone else did and get baptized for repentance. Jeff stole a little bit of my sermon this morning. John was baptizing for repentance of sin, to tell them to change, to be different. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about repentance next week. I think I got them in the reverse order. But... When Jesus got baptized, he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven, that means everybody could hear, said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. You see, everything I see, Jesus didn't just tell people what to do. He led by example. And I think that's the first point of why we should get baptized. Jesus did it. Secondly, right in step with that, Jesus told us to baptize. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus said, go make disciples. And when you make disciples, baptize them. And he told us how to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today, when we go outside and we go to the little dunk tank, 
I'm not going to make a big elaborate speech. I'm going to say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because that's exactly what Jesus told me to do. Number three, this is probably one of my favorite scriptures on baptism. It comes from Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul says, For you are all children of God through your faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Think about that. The word baptizo means to fully submerse. When you go into that water and you come out of that water, Paul says you're, it's literally like you're putting on new clothes. You're clothing yourself with Christ. That's a vision I can get my arms around. That feels good when I walk out. So I'm not getting baptized because someone told me to because it's the right thing to do because it's the next step in my progression. I gave my life to Christ. i got to get baptized and I need to go feed the hungry. I better make sure I'm tithing. See, we create this checklist of things we got to do. And we're taught that checklist. But I want to get my arms around. When I come out of that water, it's like I'm putting Jesus Christ on. I've got new clothes on. Does it feel good when you're dirty to go home and take a shower and put new clothes on? When you put on Jesus Christ, you're putting on new clothes. Number four, we know it's very important. So Acts 8, 36 through 38. So let me set the stage. So Philip is in the middle of the desert. He meets this eunuch. He leaves the eunuch to Christ. I'll pick up in verse 36. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. What does that tell me? They're in the middle of the desert. Is there a lot of water in the desert? No, it wasn't there. I don't know. My vision is there's not a lot of water in the desert. Now, this eunuch hadn't been in church all his life, right? Some of us have. What's going on in the story? Let's break the story down. What's going on? Philip shows up. This guy comes up. Philip tells him about Jesus. Obviously, as Philip told him about Jesus, told him about him being a Savior, told him what it meant to believe, he must have told him about baptism as well, right? And the eunuch got it. So much so that when he found water, he went and got baptized. Here's what I don't know for a fact, but I've been told. See, I made that clear. It's not necessarily in the Scripture, but I've been told. It was most likely drinking water. So baptism was important enough for the eunuch and for that situation of Philip that they stopped and potentially totally polluted somebody's drinking water to get baptized. Here's my first step on the toes moment. Because some of us won't get baptized today because we ain't got the right clothes and we ain't got our makeup and we can't do our hair. I'm going to come back and step on some more toes later. Number five. We know from Scripture in Romans that baptism literally represents Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 1 through 11. Well then, this is Paul, well then, should we keep on sinning so God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Doesn't that sound like a lot of our world today? It's okay. I got God's grace. I believe in Jesus. I can keep on sinning. There's no repercussions from it. I got His grace. That's not what Paul said. Maybe things weren't so different 2,000 years ago. Well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? You see, all these passages, they link and talk about salvation and immediately you believe in Jesus, you have faith in Jesus, and your baptism. So there was just an assumption here. There's just an assumption that every time someone was saved, baptism came right with it. I told you, don't jump to conclusions, though, on what I just said, though. So just let me get there. He says, so, or have you forgotten that you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined in His death? When you go under that water, and you're completely submerged in that water, what does it represent? It represents an old person, full of sin, dying. Dying and being buried. Because that's what Jesus did for you. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. When you come out of that water, the representation is Jesus' resurrection. Since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. 
We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. we got a whole awesome song we sing around that. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and He will never die again. <coughs> Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin. But now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. When you go under that water and come up, you're representing everything Jesus Christ did for you. Next, so the first two, what is baptism? Why should we get baptized? Not a lot of controversy. We're going to step it up in controversy. Who can baptize? How many of you were raised in a denomination or church that said only the pastor can do? At least a significant portion of you. How many of you would be shocked to know that there's nowhere in Scripture that says that? Zero. Zero. Zero Scripture that says a pastor or church leader has to baptize you. Zero. In Matthew, we already said it. Let's go back. Jesus said, make disciples and baptize. There's kind of an insinuation there. You go make the disciple and you baptize. Let's go back to Philip and the eunuch. Philip brought the eunuch to Christ. Philip baptized him. So there's a little bit of an assumption there, a pattern there, that whoever has taught you the truth is the one that baptized you. But hang on. More than not, the Bible doesn't even say who baptized the person who got baptized. I've got tons of scripture. I'm limiting it to four. Acts 2, 41. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So let me get this straight. I'm going to take it word for word. Those who believed what Peter had said, so Peter's talking, telling everybody about Jesus. Those who believed were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Anybody here ever baptized somebody? Anybody here ever baptized 40 or 50 people at a time? You have? Sweet, buddy. <laughs> Someone once told me, I guess Peter baptized all 3,000 of them because he was the head of the church, right? I baptized 45 people one Sunday. And by about 30-some-on, my hamstrings were cramping so bad. <laughs> I literally thought, I'm going to drown with one of these poor people. We're really going to die today in death. <laughs> Common sense, guys. There's no way Peter baptized 3,000 people, right? But the Scripture doesn't say Peter baptized them. It says those who believe what Peter said were baptized. It doesn't say who did it. Don't you think it would have told us if it was important who did it? There's a theme starting here. Who does your baptism doesn't matter. The act of doing baptism is what matters. Acts 8, 12. But now the people believe Philip's message. Here goes Philip again of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. It doesn't say he baptized them. I'm going to go on. Acts 9, 18. Instantly, this is Paul, as Saul, instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and then he got up and was baptized. Wait a second. Paul wrote how much of the New Testament? Like two-thirds of it? And we go by and I've been quoting it all morning we didn't know who baptized him? That say the leader of the church did, right? That say his pastor did. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. Paul says, I thank God that I did not baptize any except Crispus and Gaius. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. I hope none of you have this pastor I'm about to talk about as your family member, your father, your cousin, your uncle, but some pastors get a power trip out of the power that they carry as a pastor. And if they're the only one that can baptize you, what is it glorifying their name? And what does Paul say here? I'm glad I didn't baptize you. Because then you'd be able to say you were baptized in my name. And then he kind of goes off on the sidebar and goes, oh yeah, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anybody else. See, the Paul baptizing them wasn't even important to him. He just wanted them to be baptized. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And not with clever speech. 
for the fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Now, I hope common sense would set in and say that if someone's going to baptize you, they should be a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. My other hope would be that they had been baptized themselves. But in this church and what we're going to do today, I'm going to encourage you, if you get baptized today, if the person's here that led you to that point, the person's here that influenced that, Maybe they need to be the one that baptizes you. It's not a maybe. They need to be the one that baptizes you. But what's, what's religion always told us? I don't know enough. I can't say enough. I already told you what to say. And I'll stand up there with you and tell you again. I'll whisper in your ear. The point is, it doesn't matter who baptizes you so much as it matters that you get baptized. Now, again, we have to be careful not to elevate the baptizer. It is an absolute privilege, privilege to baptize someone. But we've got to be careful we don't get in that moment of becoming their Savior. Now, if there's someone that you want to baptize you and they're not here today, I'm not necessarily saying don't get baptized today. Because I think baptism, I think as we go through the Scripture, it becomes very clear that baptism is very important and something we shouldn't put off. So with that, I'm going to transition into probably one of the most controversial discussions that absolutely divides denominations. Is baptism part of your salvation? Let me rephrase that. Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? I got head shakes. <laughs> I'm not asking for a show of hands on this one. But I'm going to go to Scripture. Romans 10.9. If you declare with your mouth, number one, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart, number two, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Yeah. yeah. Wait a second. Declare with your mouth, he's Lord, believe in your heart. Can't be baptized? No, it didn't say that. I'm taking this book literally. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Declare with your mouth, believe in your heart. From that scripture alone, I can't tie your baptism to your salvation. There's another scripture that people use a lot who believe it is part of your salvation, and it comes out of 1 Peter, and it says, Repent. Believe and be baptized. But we have to look at Scripture holistically. Because I didn't just tell you baptism wasn't important. There is a denomination that says if you were standing here right now and you gave your life to Jesus Christ for the first time and declared Him Lord and Savior and you tripped and fell on the way out to the baptistry and busted your head up in the concrete and died, you're going to hell. And that is not what Romans 10 9 says. When you believe in Jesus, it should produce a change in you. It should change. If you truly believe, and, and I'm going to go to something Stu said, if you're not being lukewarm, I was lukewarm for 30-something years. I'm going to tell a little bit more of that testimony in a minute. But if you're not living that lukewarm life, you truly believe in Jesus, it should produce a change in you. As you begin to experience that change, you're going to want to do what Jesus tells you to do. And what does Jesus tell us to do? Be baptized. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying baptism is not important. I'm just addressing whether or not I can scripturally say it's part of your salvation. Baptism is representative of that permanent change. So here's what I'm going to say. If you're here today, you haven't been baptized, you believe in Jesus, why wouldn't you get baptized today? Why does it matter if it's part of your salvation? We're instructed to do it and obey the commands, and that's how we show love is when we obey what people tell us to do. If you want to show Jesus you love Him, obey His commands and be baptized. Luke 23. I kind of got ahead of myself, chased a little rabbit there, I'm going to bring it back. Luke 23, 39-43. This is the famous scene of Jesus on the cross with two criminals on either side. One of the criminals says, hanging. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffs. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. This man's done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. I skipped a verse there because the thief had to get off the cross and go get baptized, right? No, he didn't. What did he do? He confessed it with his mouth. He essentially said, Jesus, your Lord. Come on, dude. Let me put it in language terms and say, come on, dude. This guy did nothing wrong. We're supposed to die. You're not even scared of God when you're about to die? This guy's the son of God. Jesus, please remember me. And Jesus said, I'll be with you. The thief didn't have a chance to get out off the cross and go get baptized. You ain't on the cross. Okay? And I'm sorry if that sounds harsh. But please don't delay this. If you haven't been baptized, please take advantage of the opportunity. Because those scriptures are what are argued by denominations and have been for centuries. And what's happened? People feel condemned, they feel not good enough, and they're not getting baptized. Who's winning the battle? Satan. And what's he using to win the battle? Christians. Let's keep going controversial. Y'all go to controversy? It's very quiet in here. No one's asleep, so that's good. <laughs> was the way I was baptized correct? Uh-oh. First of all, I have to go to what the word baptizo says. It says to fully submerse. This is also something that is, it separates denominations. <laughs> There's nothing that I can find in Scripture that says there's anything wrong with doing it different ways. But if I go back to the Word, it says to submerse. So all I can tell you is today, if you get baptized, you're going to be fully submersed. I'm not telling you anything else is wrong. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. Let me give you my testimony because I think this will make it a little clearer for you. Growing up, I grew up in a church, a denomination called Cumberland Presbyterian. Anybody ever heard of that? Probably not. <laughs> Jim has. <laughs> Cumberland Presbyterian. Sounds like it would be Presbyterian, right? <clears throat> it's Methodist. With a different name. Somebody got the feelings heard of something happened in the Methodist church. They went and created a new denomination. I don't know if you're aware of that's how denominations were started. Every one of them, pretty much. Um, I just had a little conviction that I'm making fun of denominations, so I'm sorry I shouldn't do that. So... In this denomination, which is pretty much Methodist, and I'm not trying to pick on a denomination, when I gave my life to Jesus and I got baptized, I was sprinkled. Here's the deal. Pretty sure I gave my life to Christ. Pretty sure I understood what baptism was. But I went home that day, and my grandmother's a good old Southern Baptist. You know what she said to me? I said, Grandma, I gave my life to Christ today. She said, you're still going to hell because you got baptized wrong. I told you that I'm going to fully submerge you because that's what the Bible says they did and that's what the word means. But I didn't tell you you're going to hell if you don't do it exactly the way I said it. The problem is I can't find Scripture to completely go one way or the other. I'm just saying if Scripture says to fully submerge, why well, would The problem is my grandmother didn't stop and explain Scripture to me. She put the fear of going to hell in me. Okay? I didn't get rebaptized because guess what happened? I had a lot of pride came up. Even as a young kid. I said, you're not telling me how to do this. Besides, my parents tell me all the stuff you do wrong and hypocritical anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? I start dating a girl in high school. She starts to cry. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to step on the nominational toes. I'm just saying what it is this morning. She says, have you ever been baptized? I said, yep. How did you get baptized? I'm like, I know where this is going. Uh -huh. I was sprinkled. Oh, so you're going to hell. Has there ever been any of that in the scripture I've read to you about all this baptism stuff? We were told to baptize. We were told how to baptize. We were given an example of how Jesus did. I can go on and on and on. doesn't matter who baptized you. But nowhere in this is he talking about Christians judging other Christians, telling them they're going to go to hell. But again, that family didn't stop and try to encourage me or read scripture or explain what baptizo means. They just told me I was going to hell. Any of you guys ever grown up in the scare tactic of believing in Jesus so you don't go to hell? That's called fire insurance. <laughs> also not scriptural. <laughs> so 
32 years old. See, that first thing happened when I was somewhere between 10 and 13. I don't really remember, but somewhere around 30, 31, 32 years old, I started going, Am I baptized correct? Am I going to go to hell? Because, see, that's the lie that was implanted in my head is that what I did wasn't good enough. Believing in God, but believing in Jesus Christ as my Savior, professing it with my mouth, all of a sudden became not good enough. And that contradicts Romans 10 and 9. But that's the lie I started to believe is that what I did wasn't good enough. And I started asking pastors what I should do. And pretty much I could go down the denominational line and tell you the response I got from every pastor and it was what their denominational tagline was. So I did this uncanny thing and I started asking God, what do you want me to do? And you know what he showed me? How many of you think he showed me that sprinkling was wrong? How many of you think he showed me that submersing was right? No. You know what he showed me through this scripture? I didn't have the right heart for either one of them. It wasn't about sprinkling or submersing. It was about Jason getting his life right with Jesus Christ and obeying him. So yeah, I was rebaptized at 32 years old. I was fully submersed, not because I'd been sprinkled, because I wanted to represent the permanent change that was taking place in my life. I don't know if I've just answered that question or not. <laughs> All I'm asking you to do is if you don't, if you were, if something happened when you were baptized, how you were baptized, did you get baptized because your parents pressured you to or whatever, ask God. Let Him tell you if you need to get rebaptized. Not me. Not someone else in here that's a human that has an opinion. Ask God. Continue down the controversy line. Should I be baptized into the church? Should I be baptized to join the church? Anybody in here been told they need to be baptized so they can join the church? Zero scriptures on being baptized into the church. But see, here's what's twisted. Remember, I already read Acts 2.41. It says, those who believe were baptized and added to the church that day. I've been in a church where they said, you have to be baptized to be added to our church, fellowship, membership, whatever they call it today. Co-op, whatever it's called. And they're taking a verse out of context. The church back then was a group of believers, not four walls. It wasn't harvest at the silos or any of these other churches up here. It wasn't saying they got baptized and were added to that four-wall church. It was saying they got baptized and got added to the body of Christ. So I met a man a couple of churches ago. And he says, I want to get baptized. And uh, we're going to call this man Jake. If I don't give him a fake name, I'm going to accidentally say his real name. <laughs> So Jake comes to me and Jake says, um, and Jake's from Brazil, by the way, and he speaks very broken English, and he says, I want to get baptized. And I said, well, tell me. And part of my job was to interview people to make sure they understood what baptism was. Now, here's an ironic piece. I totally disagree with what the church thought baptism was, but I was in charge of helping people walk through what baptism was. Beautiful. I love it, God. I said, tell me what was going on. And he said, I was raised in Brazil in a Catholic church. When I was a child, I was told that I needed to be baptized into the Catholic faith. So I was. I said, do you believe in Jesus? He said, I've never heard about Jesus. Until I met my wife and she told me I was baptized wrong and I'm going to hell. <laughs> Why do we got to be so polar opposite? Where's the scripture in the middle ground? Because <laughs> you you think in that thing, I'm just picking on Catholics, right? But no, I kind of picked on our denominational Christians too, right? Again, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes, but I have to speak what God's put on my heart. So Jake comes and he says, I've been going to, I moved to America, I got married, I've been going to an American church, and I'm learning that baptism is never supposed to be about being baptized into a faith or into a church. I'm supposed to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. He got it. You know what happened next? The church told him he couldn't be baptized because he wouldn't go through their processes they wanted him to go through. 
and do a testimony video to be shown. That's why I think it's important that we go to Scripture to understand what baptism is or isn't. Because we got a lot of churches out here that are teaching incorrectly. I'm going to go here. That same church would tell you that every person in that Catholic church was going to hell. But they wouldn't baptize that man. And you know what one of my biggest regrets to this day is? I didn't baptize him. And I found out a couple weeks ago that the church that lent us a baptistry baptized him. I hope you guys, this baptism thing is personal. This is not an act. Let's go less controversial. Can I be baptized more than once? Anybody ever asked that question before? Aaron, thank you. You first hit on every question. <laughs> There is no scripture that says how many times you can be baptized. Zero scripture. So I think the question is, why do I feel like I need to be rebaptized? I gave you my testimony. I started asking God, and God showed me a couple of things. Number one, I got baptized when I was 13 years old because of a couple of reasons, or 10 or whatever it was. And other people were doing it, and they were getting a lot of kudos and a lot of pats on the back and praise God, so I jumped right in with them. So this is where I speak to the young ones. Y'all fall asleep or whatever, please listen. <laughs> Don't get baptized because your friends get baptized. Get baptized because you want to show everyone that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Don't get baptized because your parents are putting pressure on you to be baptized. Get baptized because you want to show the world that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You may not know what all that means right now. And I'm going to address that point in just a minute. So I had a lady come to me and she said, I want to get baptized again. And I was like, okay, again, that's the key word. How many times have you been baptized? She said, this will be my ninth time. Okay, so what's going on the other eight times you need to get rebaptized? She said, well, I get on fire for God and I come to church and I do good things and I tithe and she starts throwing in all these check marks and all this. She was doing and then I started backsliding, which is a term that must only exist in the South and Bible Belt. But I started backsliding and God convicted me, so I got rebaptized. And that happened eight times, or this was the eighth time, I guess. See, what was happening was beautiful. She was on fire for God, and as she got un on fire for God, He convicted her, and she got on fire again. That's called repentance, not get rebaptized. I don't care how many times she's been baptized. It gave me the opportunity to pour into her life and explain to her what baptism really meant. And we baptized her the ninth time. I don't think I'm going to stand in front of God and say you shouldn't have baptized her the ninth time. I'm going to give a little testimony to my wife. So as many of you know, so I told you at 32 I got rebaptized. That kind of began a rebirth when I was 36. God called me to leave my sales career and go into ministry. No clue what that meant. When I was about 38-ish, I got asked to come to Cookville and baptize my nephew. My dad baptized one of my nephews. I baptized the other one. We did it in their swimming pool. All I did was ask them to invite their friends, have a cookout, make it a party, and we'll baptize them. Um, in that two years, I was doing this weird thing. I left my career to pursue ministry, and I realized I don't even know how to be this spiritual leader of my home, much less do ministry. So Wendy and I were in this weird transition for those two years. Uh, she had been the spiritual leader of our home, and now I'm trying to become that. So that day, my dad baptized one nephew, I baptized the other, and then Wendy came down into the water. And she said, I want you to baptize me. And it was, a, it was signifying a permanent change. It was She's already given her life to Christ. She's already... Um, been baptized the correct way or whatever. But the point was she was showing me and showing God that she was going to be submissive to allowing me to be the spiritual leader of our home. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Because there's nothing in Scripture that says you can't do that. I promise this is one of my last points. I told you this was going to be short. Can a child be baptized? Maybe a better question. What's the age that a child can be baptized? There's no scripture that says anything about an age. I mean, if you've heard, well, they've got to be at the age of understanding. Not in scripture. No age. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is one I'm going to be wrong on. Acts 16, 25 through 33. So let me set the stage. Paul and Silas are in prison. They're praying like crazy. Holy Spirit does something crazy. And... I'll come into this scripture. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed prisoners, prisoners were gone, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Paul shouted, Don't stop! Don't kill yourself! We're all here! The jailer called for the lights, ran to the dungeon, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone, he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Then say if he had children. But if it's just him and his wife, wouldn't it have said him and his wife? Him and his brother? Said him and his household. So I'm stretching a little bit on this one, I'm gonna be honest with you. But what I see there is that because one man believed, he went home and he told his family, his entire family was baptized. Matthew 19, 14, Jesus said, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. I'm going to baptize any child at any age if they can tell me Jesus Christ is the Lord of their life. And I will stand firm on that. <laughs> Let me be honest with you. That's the one I'm going to stand firm enough to say I'm not going to argue. I think we create confusion in kids. We tell them to believe and then we tell them what they believe in is not good enough. They don't know it yet. <laughs> believe in Christ, believe in Christ, believe in Christ. Well, you're not going to believe everything and go get baptized. That creates confusion. That sets up a lie in a small child that they're going to believe and think they're not good enough. Last two questions I'm going to make quick. Do you have to wait on us to do baptism? No. If you don't get baptized today and God's stirring in your heart and you need some more time, you don't have to wait till we do it again. Call me tomorrow. I'll come to your house and baptize you in your... In the bathtub. <laughs> Please wear clothing. <laughs> Last question, and I only asked this question because it was asked to me at a church by someone accusing me we were doing things wrong. She said, but your water's not holy water. How can you baptize without holy water? Sure am glad that eunuch found holy water out in the middle of the desert. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that one. So my goal was to define what is baptism, why should I be baptized, who can baptize me, is it part of my salvation? Was the way I was baptized correct? Place I'm baptized in, okay? But I want to challenge you. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, if you believe that He died for you, He went to the grave, three days later He was raised for you because He loves you so much He died for you. And you can declare with your mouth that He is your Lord and Savior and you have not been baptized, here's my challenge. Do it today. Do it today. Not for your salvation, for your obedience to the man that died for you. If you have any questions about whether you were baptized correctly, ask God. Come ask me. I'll try to walk you through it, but I'm going to steer you in how to ask God. I'm not going to pressure you to get baptized today, but if you've got any questions, Maybe you should just go ahead and get baptized. My final step on the toes moment, I kind of brought it up earlier. If you 
you say I can't get baptized today because I didn't bring clothes. I might mess up my hair. It's embarrassing. I got somewhere to go after this. I don't have time. It ain't between me and you about getting baptized. There's a bigger issue going on. And I need you to address that. See, those are fine excuses for me, but don't be worried about what I think about your excuses. <clears throat> I'm asking you to lay down your plans, lay down your pride, lay down your embarrassment, and do what Jesus Christ asked you to do. Yes, Mark. How many of you, don't raise your hands, how many of you, your child has more faith than you do? See, that man Parker was talking about is in a fictitious movie, but that's kind of representing, representative of the thief on the cross. He's on his deathbed and he says, Jesus, I'm going to believe in you. I want to be with you in paradise. I'm going to pray for us and then we're just going to move straight outside. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't expecting this either. Um, the whole service, this was laid on my heart. Actually, by the, when we were back there praying, Mandy said it, everybody said it. And, and I have a question is why are we not on fire? Yeah. Why is this place not hooping and hollering? Why are we not showing it? These kids come up when we sing every morning and most people won't step out of the pew or even raise your hands. Amen. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up one time. We're going to sing, we're going to sing a song again. And I want everybody to, whoever's beside you, I don't care, grab their hand. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Whether you're, whether you're praising, whether you're shouting, whatever you're doing, I want you to pray for that person. Right now, if we can't pray for one another, we can't love on one another, what are we doing? And that's what was laid on my heart. So everybody grab hands. If you guys want to step out, want to step forward, I don't care. We're, yeah, we're going to sing this yes. song. Though.
teaching VBS at a different church, and it came time for the children to come up and get saved. And my very own daughter came up there, and she was only five, and I told her to go sit back down. She, You're not ready. Fast forward. My son wanted to get baptized. He was saved and baptized. I was supposed to meet with Jason at this like big corporate meeting, and I just forgot that it was even supposed to be there. Jason is texting me, Andy, where are you? And I was like, what do you mean, where am I? And I had forgotten this meeting. And so I ended up having to have a personal meeting with Jason and my son. And um, during that time, my daughter said she, want, she wanted to get baptized. And I said, no, you're too young. Again, I said, you're too young. And Jason said to Karis, he said, do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? And she just put her head on my shoulder and she said, yes. She was not too young. That was me. And I was turning her away. 